Ja, ja. Oh, ja. This is only like an hour and, and 30 minutes, right? But it took me like three hours to watch a movie because I sleep in oh. the middle and I have to rewatch it. <laughs> sleep. Because I watch it, I feel so sleepy, so I went to sleep and I wake up about an hour later. You watching the video? Or? Yeah, the movie. So the moral is come to class. <laughs> yeah. It does take two times as long to get through it. Does anyone have any information on our missing comrades? Are they ill? Have they quit the class in despair? Have they decided to join the French Foreign Legion? They're trying to find the shortest path. (laughs) Yark, yark. (coughs) Nobody knows? Nobody here. Are they panicked because of the homework? Are you panicking because of the homework? No, we're tired of it. Tired of it. Well, you're like me, though. Yeah. Well, I am having office hours today, and I expect to see lots of people there. So you still don't have a graded yet, and so our homework will not be graded. So uh, <laughs> yeah. I cannot promise to return your homework one before Thursday. That's correct. I mean, I'll get it back to you somehow. Um, you know, I might have to hire someone off the street. <laughs> Maybe that guy who advertises the tacos across the street. <laughs> um, so I... Uh, yeah, what happened was we had a grader lined up for the course and then she got a better offer. <laughs> so, you know, she got a real job, which is great for her. You, you could take advantage of us. We, we can grade ourselves. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm strongly considering that. Yeah. Yeah. 
So by the way, I mean, when I send out these solutions like to homework one, I'm assuming that you're carefully reading the solutions and that if things are confusing, um, or, or for that matter, if you found a very different solution, that you'll let me know. I'm also assuming that when I write up these solutions and post them, that that's helping you calibrate kind of the level of formalism that I expect, which is not that formal, actually. Um, you know, uh, I want you to give names to things if we really need to refer to them, but I don't necessarily want a whole lot of symbols. I, I want the idea, um, and as long as the as long as the logic is sound, um, you know, that's what I'm looking for. So, uh, all right. So, one thing that uh, so as I said in my email, um, one thing that we haven't discussed, which I know I know that a lot of you, maybe most or all of you already know, but we haven't discussed it, is, um, you know, proofs of correctness for algorithms. And, you know, a lot of the algorithms we've talked about, it's pretty clear that they work, right? I mean, if you were to write down, we talked a little bit about um, inductive proofs about algorithms. And, you know, if you really, if I really demanded a proof that merge sort worked, I mean, it would be a fairly boring proof to write. I mean, I would hope that you could write it if an evil dictator held a gun to your head, but it would be, you know, it's fairly obvious what's going on, right? As soon as you know that these two halves of the list are properly sorted, and as soon as I describe this merge operation by taking one from this half or this half, whichever is smaller, well, if it's not obvious at that point to the reader that merge sort works, that's a little bit annoying. So yes, you should know how to write a real proof that it works, but it wouldn't be much fun. On the other hand, there are other algorithms, cleverer algorithms based on deeper ideas, where it's not initially obvious that they work. And this is what one of the homework problems is about, right? So I, uh, in the, uh, uh, you know, I, I described this algorithm called the floyd warshall algorithm, which is structured slightly differently from the one we discussed in class and that I discussed in the book. So um, let me remind you of the one we discussed in class. So the input is, and I, I'm, now, I'm going to use the, uh, the notation that we used in the book. The input is a matrix W, where Wij is the weight of an edge uh, from I to J. <coughs> And also it's zero if I equals J, and it's plus infinity if there is no edge <coughs> from I to J in the graph. Okay. And then remember we had this repeated squaring approach that said something like this. Um, you know, initially, so uh, I, let me describe what the output is. So the output is a matrix B where Bij is the length of the shortest path from I to J. All right. And then what we had was something like this. So, you know, there was an outer loop that whose job it is to square this matrix log n times. And then um, what we do to square the matrix was something like this, for i equals 1 to n, for j equals 1 to n, and for k equals 1 to n. And then remember, we came up with this kind of funny matrix multiplication where instead of <coughs> taking the sum of the product, we took the minimum of the sum. So Bij is the minimum <coughs> over all these k. And we can do that by taking the minimum of what it is so far with Bik plus Bkj. And then lots of curly brackets here. 
And you can see just from the nested loop that the total running time here is n cubed log n. Okay? So this was the algorithm we discussed before, but I'm happy to. Yeah, but I, I, I understood the, the very widespread algorithm, but I didn't understand why I needed the algorithm. Uh, yeah. This is well, the Okay, or or, or, or why, why this explanation is with this loop? I, I could well, so, I mean, the only reason why this outer loop is here is because the way that we came up with this algorithm. Yeah, yeah. And this algorithm is not as good as Floyd Marshall, right? Yeah. Because of this extra outer loop with log n. But the way we came up with it was by saying, well, what we really want to do is take the nth power of the adjacency matrix. And a fast way to take the nth power is to square the matrix log n times, log base 2 of n times. And then we said, well, you know, we, you know, normally we would write that the square of the matrix is the sum over all k of this product. But then we realized that if we want the length of the shortest path, instead we change this to the minimum over all k of this sum. So then this, these three loops just do this job of changing the matrix B to this sort of squared matrix, B sort of squared, where this is how we think of that now. Okay. And then this outer loop is just there to do it log n times, okay. and thus take the quote-unquote nth power of the matrix. All right. Now, so pretend for a moment that you hadn't heard of Floyd Warshall. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And um, so uh, suppose I just handed this to you. And yes, I know I've given you this rationale that what we're doing is squaring at log n times. And that may already, that may satisfy you that this algorithm will work. But um, perhaps we might like a real proof, OK? So if you've taken a course like 561, you know that a standard way to prove that an algorithm works, um, if it is an, an iterative algorithm like this, a, an algorithm with four and while loops, as opposed to a recursive algorithm, well, in either case, you use induction, right? But with a recursive algorithm, you inductively assume that the, the daughters of the function, that it, you know, the incarnations that it creates when it calls itself, return the right answer. Um, in an iterative algorithm, it's standard to use this thing called a loop invariant. And a loop invariant, you know, a loop invariant is another one of these computer science terms that we could easily do away with. Um, it's just another word for an inductive hypothesis, right? The thing that you believe is true at each stage in a proof by induction. And so the idea of a loop invariant is you try to define some sense in which the algorithm is making progress each time it goes through its loops. And um, some sense in which the problem is partly solved. And then you assume by induction that when you've gone through the loop t times or m times or whatever, that you've solved the problem to this extent. And then the inductive step of your proof is to prove that, well, if that were true, then the next time we go through the loop, we've proved it to this extent. And you keep doing that until you've solved the whole problem. So um, I have it as an exercise in the book, and I pointed you to this in the, uh, in the email. But let's do that exercise. So I'm going to claim, I'm going to prove that this algorithm works. And my claim is when we have gone through, sorry, I need to make my letters bigger, the outer loop m times, so when we've completed m trips through the outermost loop, I claim that bij equals the length of the shortest path from i to j with what property? I mean, I'm not done. So if this were a period, I'd be done solving the problem, but I'm not. I've only discovered some of the paths. It's two to the power of five steps. 
Yes. So length S of n. Length two to the m. So because what ha what's happening? <coughs> yeah. So okay. So if you read algorithms textbooks, they have this kind of annoying, you know, more more specialized terminology which didn't need to be invented. They usually say initialization. Well, this is just a way of saying what in any inductive proof we would call the base case. So initialization just means that, well, let's start, let's say that we haven't run the outer loop at all. Okay. Uh, oh, I forgot to put in here the line of code B equals W. Okay, so the, we initialize the matrix B with this matrix of weights. So when M equals zero, well, we haven't run it at all. Let's see if this is true. The claim is that the length of the shortest path, the, the BIJ contains the length of the shortest path from I to, I to J of length at most what? One. One, and that's true. Yeah. Because it contains zero of I equals J. It contains the weight of the single edge from I to J if there is one. And it's plus infinity if there isn't an edge. Okay? So, check. All right. Because we initialize B with W. Okay. All right. Now, there is another fancy word called maintenance. Is that the word? Yeah. I've tried not to store things in my brain, but they stick there, you know, like, <laughs> like you know, annoying jingles. Okay, so again, this is just the induction step. So what we do is assume that this is the case for, depending on your taste, m or m minus 1, let's say m, and then I wish to prove that going through the loop one more time now makes this true for m plus 1. Okay. <coughs> then, then it will be true for m plus 1 because if I have a path of length less than or equal to 2 to the m plus 1, then there is some midpoint k <coughs> such that there is a path of length less than or equal to 2 to the m from i to k and from k to j such that the, you know, the, the, short, the length of this path from i to j is the sum of the length of these two paths. And there it is. And as soon as you discover that path, if it's shorter than the ones you've discovered before, this minimum will put its length in Bij. And then these three loops just say, do this for all pairs of vertices i and j, and check for all possible midpoints k, whether you can get from i to j and from, from i to k and from k to j with paths of length 2 to the m or less, um, such that the sum of those two things gives you a, a shorter path than you had before of length less than or equal to 2 to the m plus 1. Okay. And once we see this picture that, well, the shortest path of this length is the sum of two shortest paths of these lengths through some midpoint k, then our induction step is done. Any questions about this? And then finally, again, the silly term, termination. Term, termination, which is a fancy word for prove we're done, <laughs> is, well, when we've gone through this outer loop all log base 2n times, we have found, by induction, the shortest path whose length is less than or equal to 2 to the log base 2 of n, which is n, which is the longest that any shortest path could be. So I mean longer. Or longer, yeah. 
So termination is kind of redundant, isn't it? I mean, Termin so the base case is usually painfully obvious. Mm -hmm. Termination is usually painfully obvious. All the interesting stuff usually happens in the induction step. That's one step and hypothesis, isn't it? Well, and choosing the right hypothesis, exactly, right? So, um, you know, this is rounded up. Or so I guess, you know, I should have okay. said this is rounded up and then this is greater than or equal to n, and we found the shortest path, no matter how long it is. So, yes, because we developed this algorithm from this repeated squaring idea, and because the idea of repeated squaring is that you're taking two paths and linking them together to make a good path with as a, at most twice as many hops, then, then you kind of know from that motivation that this is the right inductive hypothesis. And then you can prove it. All right? Now, in one of the homework problems, the interesting thing is that if you make this loop around k over the midpoint, if you put it outside these loops, then it turns out you can just get rid of this loop. And that gives you a somewhat faster algorithm for all pair shortest paths that runs in order n cubed instead of n cubed log n. Okay, in this class we don't really care very much about improving things by a log n factor, but it's a nice exercise to show that the resulting algorithm called the floyd warshall algorithm works, the point is you need to figure out what the right inductive hypothesis is. So when we've gone through this, what is now this outer loop k times, to what, in what sense has the algorithm partly solved the problem? Okay, that's the question. And then prove by induction that by the time k gets all the way up to n, we've really found the shortest path. Now, frankly, you know, you can find this on Wikipedia. <laughs> and is that cheating? Not really. I mean, on the midterm, I will give you questions, which it's not so easy to just go find them on Wikipedia. You still have to write your own solutions. It's like collaborating with a smart classmate. All I ask is that you actually learn what the heck is going on <laughs> and that you phrase it as an induction proof. Which actually the Wikipedia entry doesn't. So you mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you mean but the idea is there, you know, but it, as long as you try it yourself. I mean, you know, the purpose of this homework is, is for you to learn and only secondarily, you know, for me to uh, evaluate your performance. Is this safe yes. for the midterm? I mean, collect, collaboration. It's going now. to be a take home midterm, you know. I, I, I will, you know, I'll write some note on the midterm and. Let's not talk about the dark side of human nature right now. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you some guidelines about what I expect, and then I'll optically scan your uh, midterm, and I'll, uh, I'll send it to Google Answers, and if they find anything that looks remotely like it, then I'll have lightning strike you. And, you know, anyway. OK. All right. So this is the kind of answer that I want for that homework problem. But indeed, the inductive hypothesis is different. Right. And, and so, especially since I haven't been able to grade your first homework, if you have something written down and you're not sure whether it's a proof, or you think it's a proof, but you're not sure whether I will think it's a proof, I'm happy to look at it. Okay? I, I really am happy to look at a draft and give you some feedback on it. And if I think there's a big gaping hole in your logic, I'll tell you. Excuse me. Yes. As you said, the loop environment, or the fancy term that just, I mean, another interpre interpre interpretation of induction, right? But it's a proof by induction. Yeah, yeah. But in the case of induction, you only need base cases in induction step, and that, that is an, I mean, complete proof, proof right? So, well, it I mean, it depends, right? I mean, often, well, I mean, you often need some sort of termination to show that you get to a certain point and then you're done. It's usually obvious. Yeah. And something, some types of induction are about showing that something is true for all n or all something, in oh, which I case see. you never end. Yeah. But, um, uh, so by the way, let me give you a really good puzzle. 
So you 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 want to you want to see you know a, a nice example of induction. Did, did I already give you this one? E Egyptian fractions. No. Egyptian fractions. So the Egyptians, for some reason, they they were willing to uh, deal with rational numbers, but for some reason they really liked writing rational numbers as sums of reciprocals, one over n, but for different n's. So for instance, instead of saying 5 sevenths, they would say 1 half plus 1 seventh plus 1 fourteenth. And yes, that's equal to 5 sevenths. <laughs> and they liked this because, well, uh, I mean, well, for instance, once you have this, then suppose you add two of these together. Then you get some, if, if, if some reciprocal appeared in both of them, then you get two over that. And then you've learned some rules in school about writing two over something as one plus something else plus one plus another thing. And this is sort of like when we add and do carrying. And anyway, I guess the point is that once you have a bunch of high priests or geometers or whatever who have gained some facility with using this technique, then they like it and then it sticks around for a couple thousand years. So, but here's the question. It isn't obvious that every rational number can be written in this format. Okay? I don't think that's totally obvious. So, um, so try to prove that every rational number between zero and one can be written as the sum of different reciprocals. And try to prove it in the following algorithmic way. So what would a greedy algorithm do here? If I gave you a number and asked you to write it in this format, what would, what would a greedy algorithm do? Take out the biggest one. one you, half you would look for the biggest <coughs> reciprocal, yeah. which is less than what you have left over. Yeah. and write it down and subtract it off and see what you have left. And that's what I did here. One half is the biggest reciprocal less than five sevenths. You subtract one half from five sevenths and you get three fourteenths. The biggest reciprocal less than that is one seventh. Then you have one fourteenth. Okay. But it's not totally obvious that this algorithm will succeed in a finite number of steps. Notice that in this case, for instance, the denominator did get bigger. So you might worry that you have a nice rational number and you start carving off these reciprocals and what you have left has a bigger denominator and a bigger denominator and that actually this algorithm won't ever finish. Okay? So prove that this algorithm will always terminate in a finite number of steps. It's a fun thing, it's a fun proof because it's going to be a proof by induction, but induction on what? What's the, thing, what's the thing which is getting bigger or smaller in a controllable way so that when it hits something or hits something else that you're done? I mean, the number is getting smaller, but that doesn't necessarily help us if the denominator is blowing up. Yes? Well, yes, but think about one-third, right? I mean... That's kind of why this is a fun question, because if you write down one third in binary, it's a fourth plus a sixteenth plus a sixty-fourth, I think. I mean, it, you know, one third looks like this in binary. And so it does not, you know, if you start writing it down as a sum of one over powers of two, that sum never terminates. So the, that's why this is cute. <laughs> We're talking Egyptians here. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's no machine. We want, we, you know, we really, we really want this to be an exact equality. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, so... Um, okay, so now, so moving back on track to where we were before. So we talked about 
max flow, and we talked about min cut. So we're now about to do, today we will cover the very last section of chapter three so that you can start reading chapter four, which is lots of fun stuff in chapter four. <laughs> and very pictorial, you know. There might even be, I guess we didn't print that on a color printer, I'm sorry. So, I mean, to be honest, we've already done, I, I think in a sense we've done the technically hardest part of the course already. Because once we talk about P and then P completeness, it's all about, oh, you can turn a graph coloring into this little Boolean formula, and you can turn that into this other thing, and it's all just drawing pictures, and, you know, so it's, <coughs> it's friendly. So you, you've made it this far. Good, good. All right. So, but to finish chapter three, um, we need to talk about something which is very useful, both um, to understand polynomial time algorithms better and to understand things outside P. And that's a reduction. <coughs> okay, so what's a reduction? So how many of you already know what a reduction is? Yeah. Okay, <coughs> so the idea of a reduction is often taught to people when you teach them NP completeness. But it's actually an algorithmic idea, which should be taught as part of thinking about P. So here's what it is. So let's say A and B are problems. Okay, they're entire classes of problems, like max flow is a problem, as opposed to here's a graph, find me the maximum flow on this graph. That's just an instance of our problem or an example of the problem. So I'm talking about a grand problem like max flow. Okay. So we say that A is reducible to B if there is a polynomial time function F such that if X is an instance of B, sorry, of A, then F of X is an instance of B. So it's a way of taking examples of a, and changing it to examples of B. It's a translation from one problem to another. Now, um, and let's say that A and B are decision problems. Okay, so they, they give yes or no answers. So, I mean, notice that max flow, finding the maximum flow is an optimization problem, but we could also think of it as a decision problem where I give you a network with the capacities on the edges and I give you a number, F, and I ask you, is there a flow greater than or equal to F? And then this, that becomes a yes or no question. Um, such that X is a, you know, here I, I'm not sure, well, let's write it this way. Such that A of X is yes, if and only if B of X is yes, okay? Or sometimes we say X is a yes instance. I find this a little awkward actually, although we use it in the book. If and only if F of X. Okay, so this is just a very long-winded way of saying that F is a way of translating examples of A to examples of B. Okay, And the idea is that if B is in P, if you have a polynomial time algorithm for B, and if there is this <coughs> polynomial time way to translate examples of A into examples of B, well then, then A is in P also, right? Because take your example of A, apply the function f, which you can do in polynomial time. Now it's an example of b. Now run your polynomial time algorithm for b on it. 
and you're done. Well, that, you wish you had made back. That if and only if B of X equals yes, should that be B of F of X? I'm sorry, yes, thank you. Okay. 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 So if you're like me, it's nice to learn things by example. So let me give you an example. So um, here's a problem called the bipartite, and I'll put perfect in parenthesis, matching. Okay. So here's the problem. Uh, a bipartite graph, as you may know, is a graph with two sets of vertices such that all the edges cross from one vertex to the other. So, for instance, you could think of it as a, a graph of um, romantic relationships in the special case where everyone is heterosexual. Um, and the idea is that each edge here represents a compatible pair. Okay, so these people would not mind spending the rest of their lives together. And now a perfect matching is... Well, a perfect matching. It's a way of pairing everybody up so that everybody is happy. And in this case, here's one. Um, okay. So we found a compatible partner for everybody. So in the book, we talk about running a dating service. Okay. Now, this is a nice problem. I mean, if I, if I give you a graph... Uh, so let's say I have n vertices on either side. I could give you a big matrix of zeros and ones, an n by n matrix of zeros and ones, telling you which pairs are compatible. Okay? Is that the thing in the ith row in the jth column is a one if the ith guy wouldn't mind spending time with the jth girl? And um, so, uh, or... Yeah, so guy, guy and Guys and Dolls is the name of the musical, but um, Dudes and Babes, perhaps. Okay, so I, I never know, you know, am I just making myself more offensive, or am I pulling back from it? Am I cloaking it in irony so that we can all enjoy our sexist society, or what? <laughs> it's hard to gauge these things. Um, all right, so it's not obvious how to solve this problem in polynomial time, right? Tell me if I have n vertices here and n vertices here, how many potential matchings are there? It's like n to the nth if we didn't make sure that each person has a different partner. <laughs> N factorial. n factorial, right? It's, there are n factorial potential matchings because once I choose a partner for this person, now there are n minus 1 potential partners for this person, then n minus 2 for that one, and so on. Okay. Well, n factorial is enormous if n is, you know, 100 or even 20. So certainly brute force search is, you know, we're doomed. Well, I claim this problem is solvable in polynomial time. And I'm going to show you not an algorithm for it, but a reduction to another problem for which we already have an algorithm. And here it is. Here's a network. And I give every edge a capacity of one. <laughs> And a bipartite, a perfect matching exists if and only if there is a flow with value mm. n. Okay. <clears throat> now, actually, there's a little hitch here that you might have noticed, which is that, and this is something that we should have said before when we talked about max flow. You might worry that there could be a flow of value n, but which is fractional on some edges. Right? You might worry that one unit of flow comes along here, and then half of it goes that way and half of it goes that way, and that we do get a total flow of n, 
but without an unequivocal matching, right? Mm -hmm. But I claim that, a, a, oh, okay, and, and, and in a given network, there might be multiple maximal flows, and some of them might be fractional. But I claim that there always is a maximal flow where the flow on every edge is an integer. How can we prove that? We can prove it with our algorithm for max flow. So go back to the Ford Fulkerson algorithm, which says start with no flow at all, start looking for paths. Each time you find a path in the graph of leftover capacity, add a unit of flow on that algorithm. Okay, well, the, you know, at all times throughout this algorithm, the flow on each edge will be an integer, right? As long as the capacities are integers. So if you believe our proof that that algorithm works, you believe that every network has a maximal flow. We, uh, has an integer valued maximal flow. Okay. All right. I mean, notice that having algorithms that solve problems is a nice way to prove things about the solutions to those problems. Right? I mean, oftentimes we, prove, we, we, we use all sorts of techniques to prove things in mathematics, but one of the nicest proofs is to have an algorithm and prove that it works and prove that it finds the solution. It's just like in our Egyptian fraction problem, right? If I said just in, the, in a totally abstract way, prove that every rational number can be written as this kind of sum, I'm not sure I would know how to start. But then if I say, here's a specific algorithm, the greedy algorithm that subtracts off the biggest reciprocal less than what's left over, prove that this algorithm works. That's a much more crunchy, get your hands around it, constructive version of the statement, right? I mean, this is partly why computer science is so wonderful. It's sort of like, you know, it's, um, I mean, the, the, it makes the mathematics sort of, instead of about this, instead of about very abstract facts, it's about very dynamical, graspable facts about algorithms and what they do. All right, anyway, end of speech. So, so if all of these capacities are one and the maximum flow, or at least one of the maximum flows is integer values, well then on each edge we either have zero or one, and then that tells us who, you know, your partner is the one that you have a flow of, of one to. Okay. What's the formal definition of by type again? It means that uh, the set of vertices can be written as a disjoint union of two subsets like this. So union of these, these two things of no intersection. And so that, um, you know, for every edge, U, V, in uh, E, U is in on the left side, and V is on the right side. Uh, well, or the other way around, but we usually talk about, uh, un this is an undirected one. Okay. So there are no edges between people on the same side of the graph, between vertices on the same side. So, so given a graph, how do you find, uh, you know, like a perfect partition? Kind oh, of that's an excellent question. It's not obvious. If I took a bipartite graph and scrambled it up and handed it to you, how would you even tell if it is bipartite? I claim that if I give you a graph that you can tell in polynomial time whether it is bipartite or not. And I claim that you should think about that. Okay. But in this problem, we can assume that I've already classified the vertices for you. Okay, so we can assume that each vertex is marked uh, in this heterosexual case as male or female, and then I give you a list of all the compatible pairs in the form of a matrix or a list or whatever, and then I ask, is there a perfect matching? And, um, okay, so do you, see how this, do you see how this works? So we're, we simply translate it into a problem we already know how to solve. That's all a reduction is. And clearly this translation process is very easy to do in polynomial time. All I did was add two more vertices and add some edges between them. 
and then I take this thing, which is now an example of max flow, and hand it to my existing polynomial time algorithm for max flow. Um, yes. So according to the definition, A is the uh, problem without these two vertices, and B is with these two vertices. So A is bipartite okay, for B matching. Is B is max flow. Okay. Right. So, um, there's a nice consequence of this. So, whenever a reduction exists, so I can say that, roughly speaking, in terms of the hardness of these problems, I can say that the difficulty of A is less than or equal to the difficulty of B. Yeah. Does this make sense? Yeah, so the point is that if, if we can easily translate from A to B, if A is reducible to B, if B is easy, then A is also easy. Because if we have a very fast algorithm for B that solves it very quickly and efficiently, then we have a very fast algorithm for A. Just translate to B and then use that algorithm. Mm. So you say in the P and T sense, right? Or yeah, so now, I mean, if the translation takes like n to the hundredth time, yeah. this less than or equal to is pretty fuzzy, Yeah. right? But what I mean is in the P sense that um, if B is in P, then A is in P. Okay. But this can also be used conversely, right? It's not in Which means, yes, exactly. If A is not in P, then B is not in P. Okay? So today, this is how we're using it. We're using it to solve problems. But the other way to use it is to prove that problems are probably hard. Okay? In other words, if you think that A is... If you really believe in your heart of hearts, for whatever reason, that A takes exponential time, well then, if A can be reduced to B, this means that B must also take exponential time. Because if B were easy, then A would be easy too. Yeah. Okay. So what, what reduction, where reductions can be used in these two different ways. They can be used to find polynomial algorithms for problems by, by transforming them to problems we already know how to solve. But they can also be used to provide this kind of conditional lower bound on their complexity. So remember, from the very beginning of the course, I said lower bounds on complexity are really hard to solve, really hard to prove. We really know very little about how to prove that there is no polynomial time algorithm for, for instance, Hamiltonian path. Okay? We have very good reasons for believing that there aren't, but we can't prove it. And we'll talk more about that. Um, but what this says is that um, if this problem is hard, then this other problem is hard too. So what you get is a sort of conditional lower bound where I can't prove unconditionally that this problem is hard. But I can prove that if this one is hard, then so is that one. All right. So um, maybe actually we should start in chapter four. What do you say? Why not? <laughs> I think we've, we understand polynomial time <coughs> algorithms very, very well now. All right. Good. All right. So, it's time to actually discuss NP and we discussed this formally before, but let's uh, discuss it. it. We just discussed it informally before. So, NP is the class of decision problems. I'm going to give a couple of different uh, a couple of different definitions ranging from the least formal to the most mathematically airtight. So 
if x is a yes instance, if the answer to s is yes, then there is a simple proof of that fact. Okay. So, for instance, let's take the problem Hamiltonian path. In this case, x is a graph. Okay. So remember that a graph is Hamiltonian if it, if it has a Hamiltonian tour, or actually a Hamiltonian cycle. So a path that visits every vertex exactly once. <coughs> Well, here's a graph. You come down from the clouds and you say, see this graph? It's Hamiltonian. And I look at it and say, wow, can you prove that to me? How do you prove it to me? Show me the path. Show me the path. You say, oh, well, it's very simple. First you go over here and then go around this way and then you go this way and here you go around and then you get there. Well, now that you've shown it to me, I can easily check that the path you've just shown me visits every vertex exactly once. And I say, oh yes, you're right. Okay. That shows that the problem of the problem Hamiltonian path, the problem of telling whether a graph is Hamiltonian is in NP. Okay. Now notice that the reason why that worked so smoothly is that the, pr the property, so, you know, here's Hamiltonian path. So let's, again, let's write this down carefully about what the inputs are. Hamiltonian path. The input is a graph G. The output is, does G have a Hamiltonian cycle? Okay. Well, the point is that right there in the definition of the problem are the words, does it have a, does such and such exist? Well, if the answer is yes, and you can show it to me, and if the property that that thing has, namely being Hamiltonian, is, an easy, is easily checked, then, you know, then we're done. Okay. Um, what if... I, what if I, so now I, I come again to the temple and I have another graph I want to know about. And I, you know, pour a little wine in the bowl and sacrifice a goat, whatever. You come down from the clouds, you look at my graph and you say, it's not Hamiltonian. Right? Now I say, ah, can you prove that to me? Now how do you do it? I mean, as far as we know, there is no simple proof of non-Hamiltonianness that we, mere mortals, can understand. Okay. So, I mean, you could say, ah, well, here are 60 million clay tablets on which I have written an exhaustive search. Okay. And, but how could I even, I don't even have time to read all of them. Okay. So, in this case, proving that there is, Proving that the answer is yes is easy, if the answer is yes. But if the answer is no, it's not clear how to prove that. So this is important. It means that NP is a very asymmetric notion. So for instance, and, and this sounds totally loony at first, but if I say, ah, consider this problem, the no Hamiltonian path problem, okay? And the question is, does a graph not have a Hamiltonian cycle? This problem is not in NP. It's in a different class called co-NP, co for complement. Okay? Because now there's an easy proof that the answer is no. Because now the existence of a Hamiltonian path disproves this claim. But now there's no easy proof that the answer is yes. So NP problems, or if you like, NP properties, are the things where if the answer is yes, 
if the input has them, you can prove that to me and I can check the proof without too much difficulty. Now, remember the, let's go back to the whole Eulerian path story in the bridges of Königsberg, right? So Euler comes not down from the clouds, but from the coffee shop across the street, and he says, there's no Eulerian path. And if people said, prove it to us, if he had given them stacks and stacks of computer output showing an exhaustive search, they would have said, this is not a satisfactory proof. In that case, he get, could give a much simpler proof, namely, look at the degrees of these vertices. They're all odd. Okay, That's a satisfactory proof. So, I mean, that really, it not only, you know, what does a proof do for you? It not only makes it certain that something is so, hopefully it also gives you insight into why it is so. And pages of computer output don't tell me why. There's nothing there, even if I'm convinced by pouring through it that there's nothing there. So in Euler's case, we can, you know, there's really a compact proof in either in either direction. <coughs> um, but in Hamiltonian path, as far as we know, there there isn't a proof if there isn't a Hamiltonian path. So there isn't a simple proof. Yes. So, uh, so in, in in this definition, you only care about the yes instance. About the no instance, it's probably belongs to some other category. I mean, you can't say a problem is NP out of the no instance. So the thing which is in NP is the general problem Hamiltonian path. Okay, And that general problem is in NP because if the answer is yes, I can prove that to you. And you can check the proof quickly and easily. Okay. okay. So then you're right that, uh, you know, I mean, Keep in mind that NP contains P, right? So, I mean, the Eulerian path problem is also in NP. If there is an Eulerian path, I can prove it by showing it to you. Yeah. It's also true that if there isn't, I can prove that by looking at how many vertices of odd degree. Okay. But that doesn't violate the first fact, okay? In fact, you know, in the case of a polynomial time algorithm, in the case of a problem in P, there's an algorithm you can run. And the fact that the algorithm works, then you just look at, a, you know, it's a, a run of the algorithm and its output, and that's a proof of which whatever the, uh, whatever the output is. Actually, this definition is not yet complete, isn't it? I mean, it applies also to the P. Even, I know P is an NP. But, but that's okay. Because <laughs> P is an NP. So you're right. I mean, when I when I say that a problem is in NP, I'm only making a demand about the cases when the answer is yes. Okay. okay. I'm not saying anything either way yeah. about no. It's true that in the hardest problems in NP, the NP complete ones, which I'm about to define, we think that there's no simple proof if the answer is no. Um, okay. Uh, let me give you just another example of a, of a, a problem in NP. So graph three coloring. The input is again a graph. And the output, again, it's a decision problem. So it's yes or no. Is the graph three colorable? What does this mean? It means, um, is there a way to color uh, the vertices such that no two neighbors, no two vertices connected by an edge have the same color? So for instance, if this is the graph, the answer is yes, because there are black and black and gray and white. So I've colored it with three colors that no two neighboring vertices have the same color. So again, this problem is in NP, because if the answer is yes, you can prove that to me by showing me the coloring. And I just check that every edge has two different colors at the two ends. But if the answer is no, we're, we seem to be out of luck, as far as we know. 
Okay, so that's that's graph three color. So again, these are decision problems. Now I know that there's also the search problem, which is find me the coloring or find me the Hamiltonian path. And those search problems are obviously intimately related to the decision problem, but they're not quite the same. The decision problem just says yes or no. Is there, is there a coloring? Is there a path? Okay, let me give you a slightly more formal definition because we haven't really said what simple proof means. So it means that, um, let's, let's write it this way. So a decision problem uh, A is in NP if, here's the informal definition and here's a slightly more formal definition, how are we going to check this proof that you give me? Well with an algorithm. What do I mean by a simple proof which is easy to check? Well, I mean a polynomial time algorithm. Okay? Let's give that algorithm a name. Let's call it B. Okay? So there is a decision problem B in P, but B takes two inputs. It takes X and something W now, I call it W because another common word besides proof that comes up here is witness. So the idea is that the Hamiltonian path that you show me is a witness to the fact that there is a Hamiltonian path. The graph coloring you show me, the coloring you show me of the vertices, is a witness to the fact that the graph can be colored with three colors. Okay? But I need to check this witness, and that's what B does. Okay. So such that X is a yes instance if and only if there exists a witness W, the coloring or the path or whatever, such that B of X comma W returns yes. Okay. So I'm just writing out this a little bit more formally. Okay, so A is the problem, is this graph three colorable? The witness of A, I'm sorry, the input to A is just a graph. That problem is hard. B takes as input a graph and the coloring of it. B runs in polynomial time, and it, it outputs yes if that coloring is a legal coloring, a proper coloring, where the neighbors are different colors. And a graph is three colorable if and only if there exists a coloring that this witness checker that looks at the graph and the coloring says yes. Okay. Or a graph is Hamiltonian if and only if there exists a, Hamilton, exists a path such that this Hamiltonian path checker says, yes, this is a valid Hamiltonian path for this graph. Okay. All right. With me so far. <coughs> okay. Now, it's true that most problems in NP that you read about it's sort of obvious that it's an NP because, again, written right there in the words of the problem are, is there A? Does there exist A? Coloring, path, something like that. And in that case, you know, those things are usually to, easy to check if they work. Um, we'll see some nice examples like where um, we talked about this, I believe, on the very first day. Consider the problem of telling whether a number is prime. Okay. So again, so prove to me that the property of not being prime is in NP. What's the witness? Factors. A factor, yeah, or, or, or a pair of factors that multiply to it. In polynomial time, I just divide the number by that factor. If, I get an, if it divides through, I know the number was not prime. Okay. 
So compositeness, you know, non-primeness is in NP. It's less obvious that primeness is in NP. Turns out it is, but it takes some cleverness and a bunch of number theory to see that if a number is prime, there's a witness of that fact. And the reason it's not obvious is because it's not, you know, the property of being prime is not on its face a property of is there a blah, blah, blah. But it turns out it can be written in that way. Whereas the property of not being prime could be immediately rewritten, is there a proper factor? Is there a divisor? So sometimes, you know, sometimes it's not totally obvious that a problem is in NP. Primality turns out to be NP anyway, but we only learned that a few years ago. Um, all right, so now it's time to define NP completeness. And NP completeness is um, kind of an astonishing notion at first. So V is NP complete if, first of all, V is in NP, and secondly, every problem A in NP can be reduced in polynomial time <coughs> to B. So, you know, here's NP, and here's P, and, you know, we showed, for instance, that bipartite matching can be reduced to max flow. And, you know, although I didn't put it this way, the fact that max flow and min cut have this nice duality relationship, we could equally well say that they can be reduced to each other. Those were some of the relationships we found inside P. Okay. So B is NP complete if every other problem in, in NP, and for that matter in P, can be translated into an example of B. Well, this at first sounds quite amazing, right? So how, how could it be the case? I mean, B has to have some sort of structure which is so general that we can take any other problem in, in NP, Hamiltonian path, traveling salesperson, uh, Boolean satisfiability, which we'll talk about later, um, graph coloring, everything else. And, no it, and all of these problems can be translated into an example of B. So B must be a very universal problem. And when you first see this definition, I don't think it's obvious that there are any such things, right? Well, then you might start to think and say, well, you know, this very notion that there are kind of universal problems is actually close to the heart of computer science, right? I mean, this, you know, this is why Instead of being specialized physical devices that only solve one problem, computers are programmable devices that by putting in the right software, they can solve all manner of problems. So it suggests that that makes this sound a little less strange. I mean, it says that B is a little bit like the hardware of a computer, that by choosing the example, we can in some funny way program it to represent many other types of problems. Well, notice also that um, if I have two problems, B and C, and maybe three problems, B, C, and D, that are all NP complete, by definition, they can also be translated into each other. Okay. So what this means is that sitting at the top of NP is a bunch of problems all of which can be converted to each other in polynomial time, and to which every other problem in NP can be converted. And remember, this means they're the hardest ones, and so if any 
NP complete problem is in P, what does this imply? P is P. Right. If any of these problems are in P, then all of NP is in P. Right? If I can solve any of these quickly in polynomial time, I can solve all of them quickly because they're NP complete and I can take any other problem and translate it into this one and then use my polynomial time algorithm there. Okay. So now, all right. So the, the, the great fact, and I know that you kind of have heard this already, but we'll, we'll really go through it. A lot of the problems we've already talked about are in fact NP complete. Hamiltonian path is NP complete, so is traveling salesman, so is graph coloring, so is satisfiability. And in fact, many of the problems coming from scheduling and optimization and combinatorial search are NP complete. In fact, it's almost hard to write down a problem in NP which isn't NP complete. You have to sort of take a very special, you often have to take a rather special case of it to avoid having it be NP complete. So not only are there NP complete problems, but many of the problems we're familiar with are, are NP complete. Well, all of these problems seem to take exponential time. We haven't been able to prove that because we don't actually know that P and NP are different, but they all stand or fall together. So if any one of them takes, can be solved in polynomial time, they all can be. If any one of them really uh, takes exponential time, then they all take exponential time. Yes? So the problem, problem before it was proven to be in P, what do people think that it was in? They thought it was in a class which we'll discuss in the second half of the semester. Well, I mean, it, it is still in this class, but so BPP stands for bounded probability polynomial time. The question was, where was primality before we knew it was in P? Of course, it was in P all the time. We just didn't know it. Right. So uh, the best upper bound we had on its complexity was this class. This class is what you can do in polynomial time with a randomized algorithm, an algorithm which uses random numbers and which is guaranteed to give the right answer, say, at least half the time. Now, it may surprise you to learn that this class isn't necessarily the same as P. And the reason is that, in theory, this class needs really random numbers. But then again, we strongly believe that there exist pseudo-random number generators, deterministic random number generators, which are just as good as really random numbers for all intents and purposes, at least for the intents and purposes of polynomial time algorithms. So actually, these are two classes that we believe are the same. But we haven't been able to prove that either. Yes? You can actually do better than half. Can't you get arbitrarily close to a Oh, certainly, yeah. So if your algorithm works correctly half the time, run it 10 times. And now it works correctly, you know, 10, 10 23 out of 10, 24 times or whatever. So, I mean, if, if any one of those answers gives you, gives you the answer you need. So yeah, I mean, one half is just a convenient place to draw the line, but it can be any constant up to, as close to one as you want. Um, all right, so I think this is a good place to stop. Uh, I'm gonna be, you know, I'm going to my office. I'll be there until five. Uh, I expect to get lots of questions about the homework. So, yes. I have another question. Is there, uh, do there exist problems that are in P where it's proven that no um, reduction exists or could exist? In other words, to them? Yeah. No, to other problems that are in P. Uh, I'm sorry, do there exist problems in P? Sorry, do there exist problems in NP? In NP, uh huh. That are proven not to be NP complete. Oh, very good question. Are, do, do there exist problems in NP that are proved not to be NP complete? Well, yes and no. Uh, if P equals NP, then here's a little exercise. Then 
everything in here is NP complete. Okay? Because our definition of NP complete says you can translate it from one to the other in polynomial time. But if you can actually solve it in polynomial time, then you have no more work to do. So, um, in fact, there's a little exercise in the book that says, consider this problem called bit input a bit x output is x equal to 1. So if p equals np, then bit is np complete. I mean, I know this is a bit silly, but the point is that if, if np falls down to p, then everything sort of contracts to a point as far as polynomial time solvability is concerned. Now, it is also known that if P and NP are different, that there do exist problems in a kind of limbo in between here, which are outside P, but not NP complete either. In fact, something even more fascinating is known. It's known that if P and NP are different, then there is an infinite number of layers between P and NP, sort of an infinite number of different problems where this can be reduced to that, but not the other way around. So an infinite number of gradations from, you know, easy to hard to harder, okay, with NP complete sitting at the top. But we don't know that P and NP are different. <laughs> So you might also ask, well, are there any problems that we strongly suspect are in this middle ground? And the funny thing is that while there are literally thousands of problems known to be NP-complete, there's only a small handful of naturally occurring problems that we think are floating in between. So one of them is factoring. Um, another, which I've been very interested in, is graph isomorphism. So graph isomorphism is I give you two graphs and I ask you whether they're topologically the same. So is there a rearrangement of their vertices which turns one into the other? In this case, there is. But if they were 100 vertices, well, there are about 100 factorial different ways I could rearrange them. So graph isomorphism is believed not to be NP-complete I would say that, you know, we're not, we don't have a very strong intuition about whether it's in P or not. It could be like primality. It could be that we just haven't been clever enough yet. Um, if it did turn out to be in P, the sky wouldn't fall. On the other hand, if any NP complete problem turned out to be in P, the sky would really fall. You know, cats and dogs would be lying down together and just, you know, giants would walk the earth and weird things would happen. So factoring, um, we also don't know, you know, it also seems to be outside P. If factoring is in P, then you can break all your favorite crypto systems. And the exciting thing is that what you can do with a quantum computer uh, includes factoring. And my friends and I have been trying to figure out whether what you can do with a quantum computer includes graph isomorphism or not. So, yes? Uh, are there classes of decision problems for which the yes and no uh, answers are, are kind of equally hard. I mean, in uh, yes. So, and I and I, I, know, I see that I'm out of time, so I'll make this my last comment. So here's p. Here is np, where if the answer is yes, there's a simple proof. Here's co-np, where if the answer is no, there's a simple proof. So okay. co-np is sort of the mirror image of np. There are problems in the intersection. So these are problems where if the answer is yes, you can come down from the clouds and prove it to me. If the answer is no, you can come down from the clouds and prove it to me. P is in here, but that doesn't mean that it's all of this intersection. So we also believe that even NP intersect co-NP is bigger than P because we think there are problems where, yes, you can prove it to me either way, but you need someone to come down from the clouds, or you need to have exponential time. Um, so does that answer your question? Does that answer your 
I'm just kind of trying to ask whether there is and there are problems for which there cannot be any polynomial time checker for yes or no answers. Well, there are problems outside NP, which we can I mean NP is not the be all and end all, right? So on our first day we talked about the problem of do I have a winning strategy from this position in the game? Well, you come down to the clouds and say yes. Well, show me the strategy. Well, a strategy is a massive object, right? You need to tell me what to do in every possible situation which could arise in the game. So that problem appears not to be an input. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm